Well, good morning. I welcome you to Tarlanda Baptist Church by way of video or audio, however you might be tuning in to the message today. Today in our assembly, we will be recognizing our high school and college graduates. As you know, this has been a very different, unique year for all our students, but of course, especially for uh, the seniors, uh, some things that they were not able to experience this year because of uh, the virus and the effect it had upon the schools. And of course, one of the things is they were not able to have their uh, traditional graduation. And so we're going to try to make a little bit more of it today to give them a little bit of a special time, even as we come together at the church. And so what, what I'm doing today is merging a graduation speech with my sermon. And I certainly hope it will be beneficial to the seniors, to the graduates, but of course to everyone. And so I've, I've titled my message today, Blessed Are the Becomers. Now you might wonder, well, what is that? Well, you stay tuned and we're going to look at the scripture and, and see together what I'm talking about. But blessed are uh, the becomers. And we're going to read from the Apostle Paul's writing, uh, one verse in 1 Corinthians 13, and then a little bit later on uh, in Philippians chapter 3. You know, when our youngest grandson was in elementary school, a very interesting thing happened with him and his classmates. I believe it was when he was in kindergarten, but apparently there was just a good uh, relationship between uh, the teacher and the class to the extent that as the end of the year approached, uh, their teacher requested to move up with them to the next grade. Permission was granted, and that's just what happened. Our grandson had the same teacher two years in a row. But now just imagine for a moment that the permission was not given, and the teacher was required to stay where she was in that same grade. And suppose that the parents had come together and said, you know, our, our boys and girls just loved that teacher so much and had such a good experience with her that what we're going to do is we're going to request that our sons and daughters not be advanced to the next grade, but stay down in the same grade with their same teacher. Well, of course, you know, such a thing would not happen because parents naturally want to see their sons and daughters move forward, make progress, advance. Well, that's kind of the gist of the message today, that we are to be becomers, that we are becoming, that we are advancing, we are progressing uh, in our lives. And so the Apostle Paul has a word for the student, but he also has a word for the saint. First of all, in, in 1 Corinthians 13, and verse 11, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11. Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, obviously, Paul, in the broader the text of the chapter, he's speaking about spiritual maturity. But I'd like to borrow this verse for a little bit today in speaking to our graduates and to all about this matter of becoming. You see, we're all becoming something. Uh, we're not stationary. Some becomings are certain. They're a guarantee, like I am becoming older. Uh, some becomings are possible. Uh, some becomings are for the better. Some becomings are for the worse. Again, uh, you know, there's just things that, that are just going to happen. We are transitioning in life. And indeed, the other day, uh, I went to uh, our grandson, our oldest grandson's graduation. And just a few days before that, he turned 18. So in, in less than a week's time, he turned 18 and he graduated from high school. Well, you can believe that brought home a reality to me. That, that little fellow that I can remember as a baby, I, I, have a, I, was, I shared with him a memory I had of him when he was in kindergarten. 
and now he is leaving high school, the reality that we are indeed becoming, that we're not sitting still. Uh, you may have a loved one that is becoming slower with age and perhaps weaker in strength. Uh, you may have observed a young person and watched them and seen how that they have become more responsible, more reliable uh, in their behavior. You see, all of us can become even complacent uh, or indifferent, or we can become more devoted and more disciplined. Well, what I'm going to speak about today are the more high ideals of becoming. And it's interesting in Luke's account of the gospel, how that Luke the physician is the one who makes note of development even in the life of Jesus. For instance, in Luke 2, verse 40, Luke writes, And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And later in that same chapter, in verse 52, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. So even Jesus, Son of God, as, as the Son of Mary and Joseph, how that He progressed, he, he grew, He developed, He became. And so I want you to think with me, first of all, based upon the verse I just read from 1 Corinthians 13, 11, how that for the student, Paul gives practical implications of becoming, things that are implied in the matter of becoming. Paul said to the Corinthians, I became a man. He had a becoming experience in his life. And so when you think about it, and just ponder this for a little bit with me, that becoming, there's a number of things you can say about it. One, becoming is a process. In other words, Paul said, there was a time when I was a child, and then I, I became, I grew into manhood. I, I developed from those young years to the years that I am now. I, 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 I moved from being a dependent, that where now I am an independent, where Paul had to go out and work, you know, he was a tent maker, and, and so he was one who had to take responsibility for his life. He, he proceeded from one to the other. Now, a process has a start. In other words, there, there is that initial moment when a, when a process begins. Uh, today, the graduate can go back to that early year when perhaps mom or dad took them to school. It was the first day in kindergarten. And I guess most parents can remember that first day. Sometimes it's uh, a little bit tough. I, I remember our daughter, I remember taking her to kindergarten. She did not make a scene, she didn't cry loud, but just alligator tears just went down her face as she looked at me like, you're going to leave me with these strangers? And I gotta tell you, it was real, it, it would have been real easy for me to have said, come on, let's go back home. But there has to be a start, a starting point, and that's, a, that's the nature of a process. You, you're never gonna get there until you start here. You have to have a start. But then also a process has steps. In other words, there are increments to the process. There's bit by bit, chapter by chapter, day by day, grade by grade. You don't do it all in one big old chunk. You perhaps have heard the expression, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. And so a process has a start, it has steps, and then also a process will likely have some struggles. You know, there's no guarantee that every day and everything is gonna go smoothly. Uh, we make our plans, we, we try to organize and, and, and do everything to have things lined up, and yet, lo and behold, something comes up unexpected, unforeseen, and there we've got a problem that we've got to deal with. And yet that's, that's a part of the process. In fact, you learn, you learn even in dealing with your struggles. And so it's an important part of the process. And then also a process may have a few surprises. 
now, and I'm, I'm thinking now of those more pleasant moments that, again, are not a part of our agenda, and yet there they are. And sometimes those pleasant surprises uh, can serve to, to lift the spirit and to motivate us to uh, persevere. For instance, the student who, who goes to school and, and they make that new friend. You know, that, that wasn't necessarily on the agenda, or maybe just in a general way to make friends, but, but you make a special friend. And that friendship can be very meaningful then and even through the years together. Uh, in, in 2 Corinthians uh, 1, Paul, he speaks of a guy named Onesiphorus. And he tells how that this guy would surprise him with a visit. Now, Paul, he's in prison. And here's what he writes. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. So here Paul is reminding the people of this guy and how that even now in Rome, he would come by and visit with Paul. And, and so you see, there, there's, there's something that was very pleasant for Paul that, that, that he probably didn't expect when he, when he went to prison in Rome. Who's, who in the world? Because, you know, he told Timothy at his first appearance, he said, nobody stood with me. And yet there was a day when here this guy shows up and what a, in fact, Paul uses the term that he refreshed me, you see. Today, we'd say he blessed me. But here was Paul being surprised even in that situation. And then, of course, the nature of a process is that it's intended to succeed. You know, when mom and dad enrolled the son or daughter in kindergarten, or when you went to the eighth grade or to 12th grade or your first day at college, whatever, there was a process in place and you were anticipating it to succeed, that you were gonna complete the task. You know, Jesus talked a little bit about that matter. He said in Luke chapter 14, verse 28, for which of you intending to build a tire, there's the process, does not sit down first and count the cost whether he has enough to finish it. Lest, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Jesus said, you, you don't want to be known as the guy who started a process and did not complete it. You want to finish what you start. So, becoming is a process. These young people today that we recognize, you see, they're, they're at a point in their life, they have become a graduate. They have become. Now, there's still more becomings in their life, but they have reached a milestone. They have become a graduate. But also, becoming comes with a price. Paul said, I put away childish things. If you're going to become what God has created you to be, it's going to involve a price. Let me just mention a few. One, accepting change is a price in becoming. If you're not willing to go through any changes, I'm on, I want to keep things just as they are, then you're, obviously you're not going to accomplish very much. But becoming, it implies leaving leaving behind something, letting go of something. Paul said, I was a child, I am a man. I put away, I let go of those childish things. So it, it's a picture here of moving on, <coughs> of things being a little bit different for you, of going through change and, and transition. That's, that's a price. If you're not willing to pay that price, there's going to be a hang up in your process of becoming. You gotta deal with that. There's not only the price of accepting change, there's also the price of facing challenges. Your life is not guaranteed to go smoothly. In fact, you can pretty much count on it. That's the nature of the world in which we live. There are gonna be challenges. But challenges are indeed one of the things that we build on. It's a very real part of life. You don't go to school without having some tests, you see. 
And so it's a part of the becoming in your life, the maturing, the growing in, in your life of facing challenges. And of course, then therefore, the price required of you is being committed. Being committed, be, being that person who is, has committed yourself to, yes, I'll accept the changes, I'll face the challenges. I will stick to it. I will stay the course. Jesus talked about putting your hands to a plow, and he said, not looking back. You're going on with it. You're pressing on to the accomplishment of your goal. Another price in our becoming what God wants us to be is developing character, the forming and the shaping of the individual person. Uh, it's a wonderful thing when somebody can look in your life as a young person and someone says, uh, well, he has taken on more responsibility. That, that's a picture there of, of some maturity of a character of a person. Uh, I, re- I wrote down maturity is seen not in one's age, not necessarily in one's aptitude, but definitely in one's attitude and actions. Taking responsibility for your actions and your assignments is an indication that you are maturing. See, as long as you sit back and want mom and dad to do it for you, your character is still very childish. As long as you don't pick up, as long as you don't do the things you should do for yourself and just take on that responsibility, you are still a child. You see, character means, as Paul said, I put away childish things. So it it is a process. It comes with a price. But becoming means also that we're pursuing the prize. That there's a goal. And it it means that uh, one of those goals is to make advancement. You see, every every time we, we think about this, it's not always just that big goal down yonder, but it could be just passing this test, making this grade, you see. And so that's, that's a prize in the process of becoming, that you're making advancement. Hey, you can look back and see where God has blessed you and for where God has brought you and that there's advancement. Paul said, I was a child. I became, I, I advanced, you see, and became a man. And then also there's the matter of experiencing achievement. Now we're here today because of graduation, and that's a big achievement. And it's worthy of being uh, noted that you have achieved something very important in your life. It's not the end, but it is a big moment in your life. And so you're making advancement, you're experiencing achievement, but also receiving acknowledgement is indeed a prize. And that, that could be your acceptance at a college. Let me think what that means. I applied, I've been accepted. You see, that's, that's an acknowledgement. And we can be grateful for that and thank God for it, that he gave you the, the ability to study and apply yourself. And now you've gotten this point where this school says, we'll have you to be one of our students. Another uh, great acknowledgement is once you're finished with your education is what? Employment that a company says, yes, we have checked you out. We have read the transcripts. We see what you have done with your life. We see how well you did in school. We want you to come to work for us. You see, that is a prize to the student. And so first of all, just for a few minutes, I want you to think with me about what Paul was saying to the student and just what's the implications, what is implied in our becoming as a student. But now in in Philippians chapter three, we're gonna look at the second thing that Paul gave to us in scriptures. And this is for the saint. And we see here how Paul gives a personal illustration of becoming. Philippians three, verse seven through verse 14. Philippians three, verse seven. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yes, indeed. I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, 
for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfect, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, of course, here Paul is using his own life and what God has done in saving him and um, putting him in the ministry. And just for a moment of transparency, just being an illustration of what it means to us today as saints who are becoming. And so there's, there's three perspectives I want to take on this today. It's knowing Christ, growing in Christ, showing Christ. First of all, knowing Christ is the means of our becoming. Now I'm talking spiritually now. That is believers, our growth, our development. First of all, knowing Christ is the means of our becoming. You see, for the saint, the believer, what we note here is that the prize and the price come together. And that is that the prize in knowing Christ is inseparably linked to the price of denying ourselves. Jesus in Mark 8, verse 34, when he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, now we might say that that's knowing Christ, you see, coming after him, he says, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. You see right there, the two are inseparably linked. They're like, uh, flip sides of the same coin. Knowing Christ involves denying self. For you see, the preeminence in knowing Christ is exceedingly greater than the price of denying ourselves. Excuse me. Simply put, whatever we give up to follow Christ is not worth having. Now, I think that should be obvious, but why would I say that? Because nothing is worth having instead of Christ. And so, to know Christ, Paul testifies in this passage, what was gain for me, what benefited Paul, the applause of his peers, Paul said, I, I took that to the landfill. I, I regarded it as rubbish, something to be disposed of. And now I, I prefer instead the excellence of knowing Christ. Jesus in Mark 8 again, he says in verse 35, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? You see, there's nothing here. There's nothing that you could potentially have that is worth not knowing Christ. For not to know Christ, Jesus says here, you're going to lose your soul. And so, first of all, it's knowing Christ that is the means for our becoming. You, you cannot be what God wants you to be at the exclusion of Jesus. Being, being ignorant of Jesus, not knowing Christ, just totally disqualifies you from any possible advancement. You'll, you'll never get anywhere until first you bow before King Jesus, own yourself a sinner, and confess Him as your Lord and Savior. You remember Jesus said there's the day coming when people will stand before Him 
and they will claim to know him, to be very religious and having done things in his name. Remember what Jesus said? And then I will testify to them what? I never knew you. You see, there's a more important question than asking, do you know Jesus? And that is, does Jesus know you? For it's in that knowing, that intimate relationship of knowing Christ that opens up all the doors to that which God has ordained for us to experience. Knowing Christ is the means of our becoming. But then Paul also in our text in Philippians 3 teaches us that growing in Christ is the method of our becoming. Knowing, that's, that's the conversion, that's coming into a relationship with Him. Knowing is the means. But growing in Christ is now the, the method uh, of our becoming. And there are indicators that Paul gives us in this passage of, of a person who indeed is growing in Christ. In, in the first part of verse 12 and the first part of verse 13, Paul teaches of his, of his own life that a growing saint has a humble perspective. Did you note? He said in verse 12, not that I have already attained or am already perfected. And then in verse 13, I do not count myself to have apprehended. You know what he's saying? I don't have it all together. There's still areas in my life that need to be brought under the influence and the effect of God's sanctifying grace. Now, you see, there, there is the matter of being in Christ, and that's one of Paul's favorite uh, expressions, that we're in Christ. Positionally, we're in Christ. But there's also the teaching in the Scriptures that there is a, a, a progress, a, a process, yes, of, of development, of maturing in the faith. And Paul said, I don't have it all together. You see, sometimes if we're not careful, we come to church. If we're not careful, we church members would almost want to put on a, a, a front somehow that we don't want people to think in any way that we've still got some freckles and flaws. Hey, hear me. We're all still in that work. Philippians 1, 6, Paul said, being confident the very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, God's going to complete it, but there again, there is, there is that, that process of, of construction, of development. And we need to have a humble perspective about ourselves. We need to let unsaved people know, hey, look, it's, it's not me. Don't look at me. I, I, and we're not making excuses, but at the same time, we're not trying to put on the front that we've got it all so neatly put together. No, 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 no. A humble perspective about self. But then also in verse 12 again, a growing saint has a holy passion. Look what he says in the second half of it. He says, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. You see, when the Lord saved Paul, he arrested him. You remember the story how he was traveling he, he was uh, given to the persecuting of the church, thinking he was serving God. And the Lord arrested him on that road to Damascus. And he set him free. He set him free from the life Paul was living. Because when God saves us, he not only just saves us from our sins, he saves us from ourselves. <coughs> and yet, while he liberated Paul, Paul also said, you know what? Something has got a hold of me and I want to get a hold of it. And so now there comes in his life a passion. He was passionate before he met Christ about what he was doing. He, he said he was breathing out hatred uh, to the early church. And yet now there is a hot breath, if you please, in his soul because of Christ and so he says, now I'm trying to lay hold of that which has laid hold of me. There was a yearning, a desire, a longing for the Lord. But again in verse 13, a growing saint also has a healthy priority. He says in the latter part of verse 13, he says, Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. 
Sometimes people will give a testimony and the way they talk about their life before they got saved, it almost comes across as almost as if they miss it. That they so enjoyed that sinful life. You, you got to be careful about that. You need to be very limited about how you talk about those, those former days. And so here, here Paul is saying, hey, look, I'm done with that. Forgetting those things which are behind. Now, Paul would bring up his testimony. But Paul said, I'm not dwelling on that. That is now not the priority of my life. But rather the priority of my life is that which lies ahead of me. I am pressing on. I am reaching forward to those things which are ahead. He has a new priority about life, and it's a healthy one. It won't hurt him. It'll do him good. And then in verse 14, a growing saint has a heavenly pursuit. He says in verse 14, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, we're on assignment here. We read just last Sunday, Paul talking about us being ambassadors. But remember, an ambassador serves in a foreign country. The ambassador is sent by his king, by his president, to go to another country and represent the king or represent our president in that foreign land. And that's where we are today. We're in a foreign country and we're ambassadors for the king. And so Paul says, you know what? I, I have an assignment here. I have a purpose here, but I'm not going to stay here. I'm here for a season. I'm just here for a, for a limited time. And, and I'm not after now the applause and the approval of my peers. But rather, I am pressing toward that my goal in life is to hear God, to hear God give me that heavenly upward call to be blessed, to conclude the service here, and then the father to say, my child, what? Come home. Come home. And so you and I together, in our process of becoming as saints, it's knowing Christ that is the means, but it's growing in Christ that is the method by which we become more and more like Him. Mature Christians, are you growing? Are you growing in Christ? Do you have a humble perspective about yourself? Do you have a holy passion for Him? Do you have a healthy priority? And do you have a heavenly pursuit? One other thing I would say about our becoming as saints, not only is knowing Christ and growing in Christ, but now it is showing Christ. And that is the motive of our becoming. I mean, what are, what are we becoming? Just big, fat Christians for people to look at us? Are we learning just to get knowledge? Is it all just to swell us up so that we can parade ourselves before others and people look and say, my, what a Christian that guy is. No. The reason for our becoming goes back to what Bible teaches in Romans 8 that God has ordained. The Bible talks about how that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. And Paul goes on to tell us that God's purpose for those he saves is to conform them to the image of Jesus. And so therefore the knowing him and the growing in him is to culminate in the showing him. Not ourselves, but showing him. And so in verse 9, Paul said, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. You see, this matter of showing Christ simply means, one, that Christ is our confession. Christ and Christ alone is, is our confession. You remember in, in Matthew 6, Jesus warned his disciples of the hypocrites. Now, he kept saying that word again and again. But he said of the hypocrites who will... Uh, give their charitable gifts, who will pray and who will even fast. 
But he says they do all of that to be seen of men. In other words, they're doing it for their own recognition. But you and I, we're not here to call attention to ourselves. Paul said to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, no claim of myself here, but of Christ alone. He is our confession. And so therefore, Christ gets all the credit. All the credit goes to him. Back in verse 5 and verse 6, Paul listed his credentials. Look at that just for a moment, if you would, please. Verse 5 and verse 6, he says, Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Now, there were some then who had looked at that and said, My, what a guy. There probably were some parents who could have looked at their son and said, when you grow up, we want you to be a man just like this guy. And yet Paul, he came to realize that all those things in comparison to Christ was trash. All these things that were gained to me, I, I regarded them as rubbish. For you see, for him, that's a loss he was willing to take because in his estimation, Christ was his only credential. That's why Paul said, we preach Christ and we ourselves are servants. But we preach Christ. We confess Christ and Christ is our credentials. He's the, he's the only thing we claim. The apostle Paul, this same man, wrote to the church at Corinth. And 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30 and 31, he says, but of him are you in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that, as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Our confession, our credentials. But did you note the verse I just read? It says Christ Jesus became for us. It's because of that. It's because he became for us that we by His grace can be becomers. By knowing Him, growing in Him, showing Him. And that's why I titled this message, Blessed are the becomers. They know Him. Uh, they're growing in Him, and they're showing Him. I pray we'll all be good students in the school of grace. Let me pause for a moment and ask you, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? There's no such thing as growing in Him and showing Him until first you know Him. We know Him through the free pardoning of God's grace. When we believe what God says in His Word, He is a righteous God, and we are sinners. And yet, marvel of marvels, He sent His Son into the world to die for sinners. And the Bible says, whoever calls upon that name, the name of the Lord, will be saved. For the wages of our sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I urge you today to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, to own yourself. You take, you take responsibility for yourself. Lord, I am a sinner. I have sinned in my conduct, and yet I am a sinner in my character. It's so easy to want to blame the world for everything. But the truth is, the bigger problems in our lives are on the inside. Oh, Lord, I'm a sinner. But I believe you gave your son for me. I pray you will trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you who name the name of Jesus, honestly, are you growing? There is no excuse. There's no reason you can give as a Christian not to be growing. You will grow. If you'll come before the Lord in humility and hunger, He'll feed you His Word. He will bless you. You will grow. And 
that will then lead to your showing him. If anybody wants to say anything about you, give you the honor and all that, no, 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 not I, but Christ. May Christ be glorified as we become what he died for us to be. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word. And I pray that you will bless it. I pray you'll bless it to those who will hear it. I pray you'll bless it, dear Lord, for your name's sake, so that you will be the one confessed. You are one who gets the credit. Oh, Lord, I thank you. I thank you Jesus became for us that we might become in him. In his name I pray. Amen. us online at tarlandingbaptist.org. There you can find helpful links such as social media, additional sermons, email addresses for pastoral staff, as well as mailing addresses and telephone numbers. Thank you for watching.